was absolute pandemonium. Everywhere you look are military vehicles just bristling with weapons. These things can get very, very nasty very quickly. Turn off the camera. Turn off the camera. For certain, something bad is about to happen. They are so determined to not lose their evolution. They all thought it was a good idea, even if it cost your life. Freedom for Sudan. Sudan is a beautiful country. It uh, has an awful lot of oil and it could be really rich. It's just been mismanaged for a very long time. It's had many, many wars. It's had uh, d uh, divisions of the country. But the corruption, basic outright stealing by the regime had made the economy tank completely. And so a sort of growing youth movement had begun with demonstrations specifically against the government of Omar al-Bashir. President Omar al-Bashir had been in charge of Sudan for three decades. He's an indicted war criminal. He's known for the horrific crimes that were carried out in Darfur. But he was considered pretty much by everyone as unshaken. I can't recall in recent times, an uprising like this. People started taking to the streets. As soon as they did, there was a massive military crackdown and many, many people were killed. A lot of people thought that the protests would just be shut down after a week, maybe two weeks. People were shot and killed, it continued. People were injured, it continued. These pockets built and built and built and the numbers swelled. There was a sort of sense that the international community didn't give a damn about what was going on in Sudan, and it wasn't the case. We were under an awful lot of pressure from people we knew in the country to come out. Please come, you know, you've got to come. It's like, we're trying, we're trying. At every moment that we had almost got visas to go to the country, they were, the security would intervene and just say no. The country's very closed off. They were resistant to outside um, press, the best you could hope for was social media. It was really hard to watch this all unfolding from afar. News came through, right, the military had taken over and Bashir, the president, is actually gone. That was quite a moment because then you, you think, right, things are really happening, things are changing now. But that's a very dodgy time to enter a country. Often these things can get very, very nasty very quickly. The information came through, actually, it's possible we will be able to sort this out and that you need to get yourselves ready to go. There's always that little knot of anxiousness in your, that you have in your belly when you're going to somewhere like that that could potentially turn dangerous. As soon as you get off the plane, Everywhere you look are military vehicles just bristling with weapons. This wasn't a peacekeeping force. I mean, they were so heavily armed. We don't know if they're supporting the demonstrators. We don't know if they're against the demonstrators. You think to yourself, this is going to go one of two ways. Your instinct is to start filming straight away. But these guys are everywhere. I uh, started to very gingerly lift the camera up and try and sneak a few shots here and there and gauge the reaction. You don't want to be detained by any part of military intelligence or any military in Sudan if you can seriously avoid it. You just have to go by your wits, I suppose, and experience and hope not to be uh, lifted just because you were actually filming. Some people thought that after toppling Anwar Bashir down, everything would go quiet, mm -hmm. but it didn't. We had one of the protest leaders, Mohammed Naji, in our vehicle with us. And so, you know, he's guys at the protest site, the demonstrators, the protesters' security allowed us through no problem. But I did notice there was quite a lot of soldiers sort of standing around. One of them, we could see him start looking at us. I mean, Richie is definitely filming. Within a few seconds, the, um, a soldier comes over. For certain, something bad is about to happen. Right. Right. They think they're all speaking in Arabic. I couldn't really tell what was going on, but it was clear, it was very clear that he was not impressed with me having pointed the camera at him. I 
could sense Stuart, you know, he's starting to get a bit tense. And then he, he decides that he really has taken exception. Hello? And next thing, the back door opens and he's, this guy with a Kalashnikov across his chest is in and sat behind me. He decides, well, he's going to take us to military intelligence, a place that if you normally go to, probably you come out of, if you're lucky, days later, maybe never at all. I mean, this was not a good place to go. Once we were in the military HQ, there was a load of soldiers in this room and still don't, didn't know what was going on. But then I started to see the odd smile crack. And then you can feel the tension just going down. And I was like, all oh, right, I think we're going to be all right. Once they were satisfied with who we were and what we were doing, we were out and sent on our way. Normally, that would have been a very, very long and difficult experience. You'd have been stuck inside and probably in an awful lot of trouble. So that was a, probably a really good indicator to us then, that things are actually different. Because that would never have happened just a few years before, a few weeks before, a few days before, maybe even a few hours before, that would never have happened. When we actually finally got into the protest square, I was like, wow, this is, the, this is it, this is where the people are. Everybody was high on life. And this crowd was just phenomenal. And everywhere you looked, there were people, and sometimes they were in groups chatting, sometimes they were singing, sometimes just banging. <laughs> This was a revolution that had had success but hadn't ended. They wanted a change. They wanted to put their own people into government. They wanted the military to step down and to go away. We were amongst the first foreign journalists to show up at the sites and people were like, are you journalists? Where are you from? I was like, oh, we're from England, we're from Sky News. Oh, amazing, welcome, welcome. And they were slapping Stuart on the back and shaking Richie's hand. It's selfie after selfie after selfie, and that was a brilliant moment. As you stop for pictures, people actually wanting to interview you and, and, and not interview you, but just ask your opinion on things. It was difficult to do your job because everybody wanted to come up and tell you about it. We also have this thing where people are trying to help you, right? So they're trying to control the crowd. Well, before you know it, we're surrounded by people controlling us. Everybody wanted their picture taken, so whenever I pointed my camera to, to get general shots, I would have a cluster of people instantly dive in front of me, and that shot would be just obliterated. I remember there was one instance where I was actually trying to make quite a serious point about what was going on. The ups and downs of this revolution have been absolutely remarkable. A couple of days ago, you would have sworn that... And people would be jumping in all over the place, and you had to keep restarting and restarting. After that, a cabinet is going to be formed. You could get overwhelmed quite easily while trying to speak, and nobody letting you think straight for you long enough. Just keep, keep, well, keep, keep well back. I'd lose Stuart in the crowd. I couldn't hear him. You know, it, I, I just couldn't get the shot. And sometimes we just had to walk away, let it all come down, work out what we were going to say, and then walk in again and just, and then hit the button and go, right? And you're going to get one shot at it. And that was it before the same thing happened again. The ups and downs of this revolution have been quite remarkable. A couple of days ago, you'd have sworn all conversation, all negotiation was over and that this was going to turn violent again. I never thought I would see a crowd and a militia who were the original Janjaweed, dancing and singing together. We've only ever seen people really scared, not dancing with soldiers. I didn't think it was possible that that would happen, because in the past they had been so scary and, and actually so ruthless and nasty. So you never thought you would see this, right? No. Never? Never. Not in my life. But always in the back of your mind, you don't know that 
that's going to stay like that. It had only been a very short time period before, it was just a matter of weeks before this military was firing on its own people and killing them. Gunmen had gotten themselves into positions on high-rise block that overlooked directly down into to where the people were all gathering. <laughs> the militia, who had been sort of surrounding the crowd, actually then started joining them and started firing back up at this building. And you can see the firefight taking place. I think that that was a massive change. I think that was the one where you realized, okay, and probably when the military said, right, this, these, are, these people aren't going anywhere. And all throughout the protest side, people would carry posters of the martyrs, as they called it, people who died. And you'll see sort of shrines to them on the floor and they're up on the railway bridge when, which was the central focus of the protests. We were still really interested in meeting the people who'd helped get their revolution to this point and their families. So I said to one of the guys we're working with, it would be really great to meet one of the families. And he said, yeah, you know, we need to do that because these people can't be forgotten. Hello, how, how are you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. One family that we met was of a young boy, Abdul Azim, who was killed by the regime. We were introduced to the sister, the brother, and the cousin. It's difficult. You always have to remember that these people are going through probably one of the worst times in their life, and they're allowing you into that moment, into, to share it with them. What we do, his very nature is intrusive. Uh, you need to work quickly, you need to work sensitively. Yeah, what would you say to your brother now? They had a video clip of the moment that Abdul Azim was killed. They said they had never watched the video the whole way through. And it was harrowing. Uh, and he had faced down the Sudanese military unarmed and it was clear that he was unarmed and they had, they had killed him. But not one of them thought that the, the loss of, of Abdulazim was, was a loss. It was his death was worth the revolution. But it explained everything, that that's why this, this could win. This is why it could be a success, because they all thought it was a good idea, even if it cost your lives. And that was uh, very emotional, I think, for everyone. To see the, the younger generation coming up to support the, the revolution is, is remarkable. It's a youth revolution.
one night in particular, people had come fully expecting to have the names of the new government read out to them. And people were like, tonight's the night, this is so exciting, we want to know who our government is, we can't wait. Big night for the opposition because this is the night they're going to name the names of those people they think should be in government and people are going to express their approval freedom of being told how to Sudan. do it. Freedom, freedom for Sudan. Is, big, is this a big night tonight? Yep. Yes, this is democracy, yes. Eh? yes, exactly. This is the democracy that we are seeking for, you know, a decade actually for our people and for our nation. Okay, have a good one. Thank you. Nice Thank you. Yeah, amazing stuff. It was just this fantastic rock concert like atmosphere. It's thousands and thousands of people crammed in into the, this space. It's a water effect. It's amazing. Amazing. Had people with their phones up and everywhere you looked around you and it was absolute pandemonium. I was struggling to see at one stage and these guys who had clearly been there for hours were and were standing on these plastic chairs just stood down and said oh, off your pot and get up there and I got the shots and then we wanted to go closer and so I went to hand back the plastic chairs and he was like no please take it and we we had to make our way through through the crowd and everybody was parting for me and my plastic chair so that I could get the shots it was great you could see that it was taking an awful long time for these people to come forward you could see that there were little huddled groups on the main stage and then the sort of addresses to the crowd became more like do we have to stay on the streets we have to keep fighting for the revolution uh, that things aren't going absolutely perfectly <laughs> The military doesn't want to, 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 to give it to civilians. So you're worried that this is, yes, yeah, it I'm, looks good, but it doesn't, it's yeah, not yeah, there yeah. yeah, exactly. It was pretty amazing how quickly it switched, actually. We eventually uh, sort of extracted ourselves from the crowd. We're heading back to the hotel, and uh, the, in the, the radio in the car was on. And Gailey, who was our, our producer, started translating for me. There's problems. Negotiations have broken down. So not good. No. The revolution continues. Did this mean that the military would impose itself on, on, on the crowds? Did this mean that they would actually have to go back to the streets and to die again? And what will happen next? We just didn't know. work in foreign countries. We rely so heavily on producers and journalists who, who live there and who know the country better than we'll ever know it. But of course we come in with our ideas and, and without, in some cases, demands. We want to go and see uh, the military, we want to see the head, we want to see the number two, we want to actually go with the soldiers. And you're going to have to be the ones that ask. And they just kept sort of looking at us going, guys, be realistic. Military council. They, they just shut down. They've completely closed themselves off and they're getting on with whatever it is that they need to get on with. It's just military style. They don't want media, they don't, they don't want attention. Yeah. But we'll keep trying. That's why we're here. We're trying to just get to the bottom of it and perhaps provide some answers for the people who are all outside. We then had a phone call saying, like, get yourselves ready. Um, but we're going to do the leader of the military council um, at the presidential palace. Lo and behold, they made, uh, they made that happen. Well, we're inside the uh, palace grounds now. This is the presidential palace, and we've been summoned. We've been given about five minutes to get here to meet the head of the uh, military council, and we were already told we're late, even though we only just found out. I'm not really sure what to expect or, uh, or what he's got to say. Here we go then. We're right. all quite nervous as to whether you're going to get it right, whether you're going to mess up the interview, how long is it going to take. Richard's got virtually no time to set it up. These guys don't have, they don't have a tendency to stay around if things aren't in place. I, I was sweating that day. It was hard work. Yeah, it was, it was quite, it was a lot of pressure. And all the while you've got a senior general of the nation sitting there looking at you going, come mate, hurry it up. Yeah, the pressure's on. Three, two, one, start. General, do you guarantee their safety in the coming days and do you have plans to move them out or are they free to stay? <laughs> Uh, 
لذلك سنوفر لهم الحماية حتى نصل إلى اتفاق مع قادتهم by just getting into the presidential palace, by sitting down with the head of the military council to get him to answer some basic questions about the future of the, uh, of the, of the youngsters uprising. It felt, oh, yeah, actually, this could work. This actually could work. Doesn't mean it will. Doesn't mean it won't all just go badly wrong. But at that instant, I think we all felt, wow, this has moved on. And we've been here to witness it moving on significantly. Those last days of us there were, was, a, was a sudden massive change. It was the bit that we realized we'd come, it had been high, it had gone low, and it had gone really high again. And it was hard to imagine that plateau being dropped off significantly. The military have reached out. They're now going to form a council, half of them military, half of them civilian. And after that, they're going to make a government, a prime minister, a deputy prime minister and cabinet ministers. Now, this is a massive jump because it is these people who will decide who makes up that government. It's unheard of here for the last 30 years. It's been a military dictatorship. We are looking for a good things, for a good leaders we are looking for a peace it was very clear that they were anything but deflated and these people were not about to give up anytime soon people were arriving the pictures were amazing just the sheer volume of people there's over a million people they say are going to be here today i can certainly believe it trucks with people and flags and singing and chanting there were big um, sort of human snakes going along with big flags on top of them And they would come in on these trains with just thousands and thousands of people hanging on to them and joining in. The numbers were growing all the time. That was the moment, that was it. That was the sort of everyone around you believed, right, the talks were back on and more of us are arriving by the minute. So we're not going to give in. It was really a privilege. It felt like a privilege. I kept pinching myself to be here in this moment that was so important to the next generation, to the younger generation of Sudanese. This moment where they thought our future is going to change. And they are, they are so, so, so determined to not let it go, to not lose their evolution. I may be wrong, but I've got, you know, no doubt they're going to achieve what they've set out to achieve because, you know, they, I've not seen determination like that very often in my career. You'd have to be a real sceptic to not be carried away with the optimism. So I said, you, you know, I, I am sceptical enough to know that this optimism can be not so much misplaced, but it can be mishandled. But everyone acknowledges that they can't ignore the youth. They are bringing about the change that their parents weren't able to do. They, they were unstoppable. It was, uh, it was amazing.